We are recording this talk, so please do me a favor and ask your questions in the chat window, and I'll relay them to Dr. Brody when she's ready. Um, like I said, my name is Molly Kelly. I'm the conference chair 2020, and I would just like to uh, briefly introduce Dr. Brody, who will speak on literacy in the brain. Uh, TESOL International is proud to sponsor this talk. Dr. Brody has far more accolades than I can mention without cutting into her talk, so I'll just leave it at this. Uh, we're very lucky to have her, um, not just for her extensive experience with respect to TESOL International and with the seal of biliteracy, um, but also as an immigrant and second language learner herself, um, as well as an advocate for international communities and their teachers. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brody. Hello everybody, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yes? Yes. Okay, yes. Great. thank you. Um, thank you Molly, first of all, for, um, for inviting me and uh, I wanna give Molly Let's all give Molly and her team a great uh, round of applause because they pulled this thing together after planning for the other face-to-face -face conference before, and I think they deserve a huge round of applause for their work. <clears throat> and um, secondly, thank you for coming here so early in the morning to be with us, and uh, it just goes to show what kind of dedicated professionals you all are. Um, before I start uh, my presentation, I want to share with you that your part of the country was my old stomping ground. I was a teacher and later teacher trainer in um, Missouri, and I did a lot of uh, student teacher work in Kansas City, Kansas City Public Schools, so I know my way around there. And later on, I uh, worked in elementary school as a, a professional um, it was a professional development school with cohorts of teachers in elementary school while I got my doctorate at the University of Nebraska. So yay, big red. Um, I um, have a strong connection to your area. Plus my husband has um, relatives in uh, Nebraska and Iowa. So I'm so glad to be here out of all these reasons. And so now I wanna talk about the brain and um, literacy. If we have time, I would like to show you a fantastic video of brain activities later in the show. Um, let's see how we do on time. Um, so um, I'm going to skip this video here. Basically, we're talking about firing and wiring. Every time we do an activity, um, it, it will um, be absorbed, will be uh, conducted by our brain. And in the same moment when the brain does any activity, whether it takes in stimuli or hears something, any senses, it fires, neurons fire. And the, the more they fire in the same part of the brain and uh, because of the same activity, they wire pathways. And they are like super, super miraculous highways. And they allow us to do things that we thought we could never do. All of you who ever learned a foreign language, for me it was uh, English, French, and Latin, um, know that in the beginning uh, you think so hard about even the conjugations of, of the most simple words. And after a while you go like, oh, I don't have to think about that anymore. It's automatized by the brain, right? And this is because of our neuroplasticity building pathways. And so um, I want to start my talk by by drawing to your personal connection and on your personal experience that you have to make clear what superpowers teachers have to build those neural pathways. If you are doing it right, you can have a much higher outcome with your students. And we know some of those terminologies like comprehensible input, you need to talk in the way students' brains um, process it. And we know um, from theory, um, scaffolding and recycling and all these things, you know. But sometimes we forget about that in, in our teaching and we're teaching in a way that students' brains cannot adequately 
make use of building of information to fire and wire. And so that's what I'm going to talk about specifically for literacy and reading. So let's do it. So believe it or not, but there are clear parts of the brain that are responsible for processing certain words. Um, reading, uh, there's a uh, one part that's only uh, dedicated for vision, one is dedicated to hearing words, one is think for thinking words, and one is for saying words. And all of these parts are so important to stimul stimulate in our instruction with students because they all work in concert. And the reason that the brain and language has gotten so much more attention in recent years is because we had a lot of um, traumatic brain injuries that um, showed evidence of how the language systems are processing in the brain. We also have a lot of advances in, um, in taking pictures of the brain in real time and a lot of more research is done that way. And so we learned a lot more than we did in the past. Here's the good news. All humans have an, in, uh, have an inborn ability to acquire spoken language. And we know that. We can go to the poorest neighborhoods in the poorest countries and all of a sudden kids in the street speak to you in English and French and <coughs> all kinds of languages. And you go, well, they didn't go to school. How did they learn that? But they can acquire spoken language from hearing it. Every human being has also the ability to distinguish sounds. And also, luckily, we have the ability to associate sounds to written symbols. And here on the right side, you see a, sim, um, a um, brain scan. Yeah. I still hear background noise here from people who didn't make sure it. Um, you um, see a passively viewing words. It engages this part of the brain. Listening to words engages this part of the brain. Speaking words engages this part of the brain. And generating words, this part of the brain. So in our instruction, we need to pay attention to engaging all these parts of the brain. So we are like building newer pathways like crazy. Um, and um, the neurological pathways are mostly in the left hemisphere and they're separate networks. This is important for nouns and verbs. So we need to pay attention to distinguish those. And of course, the more complex the language is, the more pathways are needed. So that's why um, we have the statistics about how long does it take to be a novice learner of English, of um, Arabic, of Chinese. And of course, the times um, vary greatly. And it's because of the neural pathways that need to be built and the automaticity that's needed. Um, Here's another interesting fact. In all languages, there are only 170 phonemes that form syllabi. But only phonemes that are repeated get the brain's attention to fire and wire, okay? So remember when you talk to babies in the beginning, you repeat um, phrases all the time. You know, you say the same things over and over. And then the baby does it too. The baby repeats after you over and over and over. And that's because of the firing and wiring. And when you want to see evidence of fire and wire, just watch a little baby and how they um, repeat after you. Um, of course, learners respond to um, motherese, rhythm, cadence, pitch. And the brain is predisposed to noticing and mimicking language and phoneme even before birth, starting uh, when a fetus is nine months old, uh, five months old in the mother's um, womb. They can already recognize speech. This is so interesting. Um, but language exposure is environmental. You know, um, how much language a kid is exposed to determines how much they fire and wire in the brain and build pathways. So we know that when we learn our first language, the phonemic awareness creates the production of phonemes and they are unknown to the baby. And you can transfer a lot of this also to second language learning because the phonemes are also unknown to the learner. And it takes only a very short time until the brain can discriminate how, um, how many sounds they've heard and distinguish between them. 
and after 12 months, neurological pathways are built. And this is really good news because as second language and third and fourth language learners, we can build on those pathways that are already there for grammar, clustering, um, expressions for certain things, and we can build on those. Um, that's why we also encourage that um, ESL students um, use their own L1 to do tasks, you know, because they can build on, on the neural pathways. And um, the, the critical time is when you transition from phonemes to words and morphemes. Um, as mother is in instinctively assists with intonation, rhythm, and emotions, and babies can differentiate sounds, and babies can build a new vocabulary with seven to 10 words per day because they create a mental lexicon. And the same thing is what happens to our second language learners. Only when the baby already knows this is a chair and this is a dog. Remember when babies see the first animal with four legs, like a dog, they call all animals with four legs a dog until they know this is a cow, this is a goat. And it takes them some time to make that distinction, right? But they have it in their brain. And with our second language learners, we can build on this lexicon that's already there. We just need to assign new words to it. But that's why second language learning is um, built uh, significantly on the first. So we also need to pay attention to verbal-based versus image-based words because our brain has two separate storage facilities for meaning and information. Um, and uh, that's why as teachers, learning about a new word while showing or seeing an image of the word makes it much easier for the brain to store. Because as you see in the picture, seeing words engages one part of the brain, hearing words another, and when you do both together, you engage a lot more of the brain, which is needed for fire wiring and building pathways. So again, you know, um, show students uh, images of the words when you teach them new vocabulary at the same time. What more is important? Um, then when we get up, up in the hierarchy of learning language syntax and semantics, of course, we all know practice makes perfect. Uh, perfect. Our grandmothers knew that. More exposure builds more formation of language hierarchy. Phonemes build morphemes, milk word, build words, words and prefixes and suffixes and infixes and changes of consonants to vowels once words are put into phrases and sentences while following the rules that need to be learned. And um, that's all what our brain needs to manage. And that's a huge task. You know, fortunately, our second language learners already can build on the knowledge of all of this, even though they are not aware that they have it, but um, we can build on that. Um, so our brains, use the front of the temporal lobe to create meaning by combining words into sentences. And like a miracle by age three, toddlers can say sentences that are 90% grammatically correct. And um, second language learners can do the same, even though we know that the vocabulary of academic language takes seven to 10 years to acquire. The more exposure a student has to, to um, the um, content of language, the better they retain it, the better they can master it, right? Um, they need to um, engage their mental lexicon. They need to learn the rule of grammar. And uh, one good example is um, one thing that I see a lot with language learners and also with babies when they learn um, English as a first language they understand at a certain time that ED at the end of a word signifies past tense. And then they're applying it to everything. They say, daddy, mommy, drive the car. And um, of course, grammatically it's incorrect, but um, by the rules, it is correct, right? So second language learners do the same thing. You know, they absorb a rule and then they apply it to everything until they get exposure to irregular verbs. And that's one good example of showing how that works. Um, 
one thing that we need to keep in mind for English language learners is that children that learn English as a second language often have problems based on the different syntax habits because as we already established when they learn their first language they already established their syntax rules right and what happens is they have their own language interference you know like the adjective follows um, the um, the noun and so forth you know and so we need to reprogram that and I call it personally unlearn a habit because the brain is already wired that way. So we need to give them a second neural pathway um, set to say, okay, you can use your own um, L1 um, syntax, but then we have a different one in L2. But the brain needs to do a lot of work to not fall back on the L1 syntax and apply the new rules. And that's why ex exposure is so important. Um, and for instance, Japanese, Mandarin, Korean, a topic permanent language where the topic holds the prominent position in the sentence and may not even have a subject. Passive voice is a problem. And in a lot of languages, um, articles don't have a function like in English. And so um, this is a, a repeated interference with their own language, as you all know, that work with ESLs. So what's interesting is as we build those pathways, the brain clusters words of the same category um, in topic clusters. Um, and they are, <laughs> interestingly, can uh, um, doctors and researchers can say where they're being clustered in the brain. It's really interesting. And they know that from brain injury because they can observe in real time what is missing when people have brain injuries and they know which part it is. So, um, these are imaging scan results that you can see here in, in terms of a picture. Um, and uh, the good thing is that they already have these, um, these brain clusters from their first language. Here's, here's a very good semantic network visual. Um, your brain absorbs the color yellow. And what can yellow be? It could be a drink, it could be a bird, it could be a fruit, it could be um, a flower, it could just be a color by itself. So the brain then makes the decision when yellow comes in, where does it belong in my semantic network, you know? Um, but in order to do that, they need to have all these words. And this is where background knowledge is so important. Kids uh, lacking background knowledge of what you're teaching cannot have, cannot fall back on the semantic network. And it may appear that they have problems with reading, but maybe it's not a problem with the reading mechanics at all. Maybe it's a problem with background knowledge. And all of us teachers know that, you know, so we need to make sure that we pay attention to building background knowledge in our ESLs before we expect them to master certain concepts. And this is just a very simplified concept. So what we know is the brain is extremely efficient. And one of the efficiencies that I noticed in myself, I learned about 14 languages um, just to travel with them and just make it to the bathroom and order some food in addition to the um, three that I mentioned before. But it's really interesting. Each language has some really cool words. And every once in a while, when I think of a certain uh, thing or want to do something, this word pops in my brain in Greek or whatever. And i um, thinking, well, that's not the language I'm using, but it's the most efficient word for the situation. You know, the brain goes the shortest path. So it may be that there's interlanguage in your students where they want to say something in English and all of a sudden a Spanish word pops in their head because it's the most, the most appropriate word for the situation. So that's a really weird thing that happens. <clears throat> the brain does not need to remember every single combination because the neural pathways can make up for that and can fill that in. And um, interestingly, the um, several brain areas collaborate in uh, the changes of syntax and meaning. So when we're switching from a language with a different syntax to English, um, we need to engage both of those brain areas um, because they can help the student to navigate the new rules. 
and repetition matters. So, of course, we know that literacy and reading is the key for our students. If they don't master reading, how can they unlock the rest of the curriculum? Math, word problems, um, science, um, social studies, the different uh, forms that we use language in social studies is different from the reductive um, direct form of using language in math. But if students don't understand the difference, they cannot unlock the content they need to learn for mastering school here. So what what do they need? In the first stage, in the pictorial stage, the brain literally photographs words. And then adjusts the picture to the alphabetical shape of the letters, right? Can you imagine you're like a Mandarin native speaker, Korean native speaker, and your language is completely different? How much um, neural um, firing and wiring they need for the picture to form an alphabetical shape in a new uh, writing system? So uh, we need to pay attention to that when we teach our ESLs. The phase two is a phonological state where the brain begins to decode letters into words. In all of us who learned a foreign language, we know when we were in the beginning stages and we heard a radio or TV show, and oftentimes it appears that whatever text we hear is like one long word, because we are not able in the beginning to distinguish when one word ends and the next one starts, right? And that's the stage where we start doing that. And phase three is our orthographic stage where the brain actually recognizes words. That's the magic, magical moment. And uh, we all remember, whoever has kids, we remember when our kids had that experience and we said, oh, it clicked with them. They can write their own name. How cool is that? They can write mom. And they recognize the uh, manifestation of something that they understand and can use, but they can express it in written form as a word. That's a huge deal. Here are some warning signs, warning, uh, warnings to teachers. Though acquiring spoken language is innate to every human, but reading is not genetically wired. And that's a really big deal for the brain, you know, because um, that takes a little bit more effort to acquire. It's kind of artificial because the brain is not um, pre-wired for it. Le uh, reading, of course, is much more successful when the readers have a strong mastery of vocabulary, and that has to do with content knowledge and um, decoding text differently. So we need to pay a lot of attention to preparing them in vocabulary before we give them pieces to read. Reading is, of course, more successful when readers have already used the words they're reading about. So that's why this whole scaffolding idea is so important, you know, that you carefully prepare the students for, use, for using the words in reading activities. Neural connections must exist, allowing the brain to recognize the spoken words and the system recognizing them as written words. So again, that's the magic point, you know, where students begin to recognize words as words. And then when they recognize the manifestation of the word in reading, and that requires so much brain um, wiring, you know, for, for being able to do that. And reading also depends on the mental lexicons. I already talked about that. That's related to background knowledge. If somebody has very little background knowledge, it's much harder for them to read, even though they may understand the mechanics of reading perfectly, but um, they cannot connect it to a mental lexicon. Therefore, um, the learning application uh, implication of background knowledge teaching is incredibly important. So, um, you know, here, here's another little um, a diagram of definitions. I'm not going to go into all of them. But here's something extremely important about English. And when I learned about this the first time, I'm like, that's why English is so difficult. You know, even gramma grammatically, English is a quite simplistic language. But when it comes to um, the correspondence between pronunciation and, and spelling and deep orthography, it's a terrible language to learn. The English alphabet does not have a direct relationship between phonemes and graphemes. 
And it's extremely difficult for the brains of English learners to recognize patterns in spelling and reading are most difficult. Look at this, Italian, 33 sounds. And they can be spelled in 25 ways. How about that? Spanish has in excess of 35 sounds and 38 numbers of spell, uh, ways of spelling sounds. Almost even, right? German is like that too. French, <laughs> French in, on the other hand, has 32 sounds and 250 plus ways of spelling the sounds. We all know that the silent letters and, you know, uh, letters that you see but you don't say. But look at English. English kills 44 plus sounds but more than 1,100 ways of spelling them. You know how much work that takes for a brain to understand and learn all of this and to have all these pathways. Um, so it's extremely important that we practice in as many ways as possible with our students. What implications does, it, does all this brain stuff have for teaching English reading? We already know the brain is not wired for sound letter recognition. Therefore, readers must have explicit instruction that is, is reassigning brain regions for content. And one of the other things that are really counting against language learners is people don't hear certain sounds or letters and have no wiring. Like in my own life, it took me about five years until I heard the difference between miss and miss. It took me five years and all of a sudden I'm like, ooh, this is a different sound, but I didn't hear it. I just didn't hear it with my German ears. My my sound recognition didn't notice it. And Dr. Brody, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you please go back to the previous slide? I'm sorry to interrupt. Just go back to the previous slide, please. Thank you. You can continue. Thank you so much. Okay. So um I've been living here for many years and just recently my daughter who was a freshman in college just told me, mom, you always say this wrong. When you drink something, it's a sip, not a zip. And I couldn't hear it and she said it a few times and then I heard it and I've been living here forever. And so you need to check if your students even hear the sounds and there you can look that up online and you can, you can see that um, Certain languages, uh, populations using certain languages cannot hear certain sounds in English. And so you need to pay attention to that. Teachers must provide a ton of practice as much as possible. And students' visual brains need to be engaged, like we already established. If you hear and see at the same time, you form better. Okay, I'm, un I'm, I'm unmuting. Hold on. Everyone, please keep your microphones muted until the end of the talk and put your questions in the chat window. Dr. Brody, you can continue. Thank you. So you need to um, provide the seeing the word and hearing the word as much as possible, uh, seeing a visual representation of a word, and then help the students to break the words down into letters and graphemes. And teach them to create the letter to sound correspondence. Now, please note that pronunciation practice without teaching letter to sound correspondence doesn't lead to anything. So you need to always pay attention to that. You need to teach the letter to sound correspondence and pronunciation. And one of the, um, the um, things you need to do before is check if they even hear the sound coming from the native language. So there are several um, phases um, as you, uh, you convert letters to words. Uh, the first one is decoding in the pre-alphabetical phase where learners connect visual cues to a word. And you remember when, when little kids learn their first language, we have all these picture books like pig. And then uh, parents mimic all of this, right? And, but that's how the brain learns. And this is exactly what the second language learner does too. Um, yeah, uh, the brain is uh, 
completely overwhelmed at this stage and almost unable to commit visually similar words to memory or retain them at that stage. Now, the uh, partial alphabetical phase is that's where we see um, kids learning the sight words, right? Um, the learner is at this point able to commit printed words to memory. They can connect one or more letters with corresponding sounds when they hear them. Learners can identify beginning and end of words. Words can be better processed by the brain because of the letter sound system instead of only visual cues. Readers at this stage recognize high frequency words. Warning, at this stage, they have very limit, limited memory ability. So <clears throat> we need to remember when they're at this stage, you cannot overburden them. And that's where Krashen's um, comprehensible input and uh, natural order hypotheses and um, um, you know affective filter come in because if you overwhelm them, they shut down and they don't take anything in. At this stage, learners cannot read text with words outside of their brain lexicon. That's a big problem for content background knowledge. <clears throat> After that stage, we have the full alphabetical phase where we, readers are able to remember how to read a specific word. They can make a connection between the letters in the word and the phonemes and how to pronounce it. And this is called the phoneme grapheme connection. Um, and it's only at this stage that learners are able to create long-term memories of the words. And of course, with that comes also more accuracy. Then it's the consolidated alphabetical phase. At this stage, readers notice multi-letter sequences, identify commonalities to letters stored in memory. They can form chunks of common sequences. And you know, we teachers will make use of that by chunking language. Um, to help them get started, right, in giving sentence frames and so forth. When encountering new words with the same chunks, readers process the chunks in the, instead of the individual letters, and they can fill in the blanks with their brain. And reading becomes more fluent at this stage. So here are the faces again on a picture from the lowest phase to the highest phase. So through reading practice, the neural system um, at this uh, latest stage does not need to decode words letter by letter anymore. This is what I called in the beginning the automaticity when um, you automatically read over stuff and you, work, you don't have to consciously work on decoding something. Um, you just recognize morphemes, uh, morphemes uh, the smallest world, word elements um, they can then decide if a word is familiar or not, and they can make a decision if they can fill in the blank for that word. And now we're looking into grammar. Um, grammar uh, comes at this stage where students know how to put uh, words together in certain ways to have the grammatically correct form. However, when you're teaching science, math, or other subjects like that, um, or high stakes testing, that's still a problem because at this stage, um, the students um, still struggle with putting stuff together. And if they're lacking background knowledge or academic language, they have still problems doing that. Just because they, um, that's where the whole Bix and Kalp by, by Cummins comes in, you know, um, the um, social language is not a mirror for the academic language. So one of the most important things that we need to remember as teachers is that success in reading does not automatically transfer in success in spelling. Doesn't work that way. If the same sound can be spelled in different ways, like in English, readers experience what they call a brain hesitation in the identification of a word. And we all know words in English um, that cause us this problem. 
the more um, spellings the word has, the longer the hesitation of the brain. And of course, this disrupts the flow of reading and spelling. Increased accuracy in spelling creates also increased word recognition in reading. So that's the good news. Um, the brain and um, the time that it takes to create memory is, is very different, you know. Um, immediate memory is takes only seconds, but then you forget it. Working memory, um, and we, we know when students say, I'm studying this for a test, or in my English class, we knew exactly um, when it was my turn or somebody else's turn to give the answer to the teacher. So we were reading ahead and looking up the answer, working on it, didn't pay attention to anybody else and just work on ours and then said it. That was actually um, a working memory, minutes to days, but it takes years to create long-term storage in your brain. Now, like I said, you know, we already have L1 to build on and a lot of the storage system in the file cabinet are already there, but now we're adding um, a new um, file folders to the, to the drawers and that takes a lot of time. And everybody who has learned a second language knows that. So for the immediate memory, um, we can keep memory for 30 seconds and it's temporal until the brain has made a decision if to, if to store it or not. And it can happen consciously and subconsciously. Like for instance, a good example is when you listen to a weather report and they talk about Iowa, this city, that city, another city, and then they talk about your city and talk about, for instance, Des Moines, and you go, oops, need to pay attention, you know. So you're, although you're hearing all the other texts, your brain doesn't pay attention to it, <coughs> but only when um, you make the decision to, to listen for that word Des Moines, you're perking up. Um, in working memory, you're um, able to process a few items in um, preschool, kids can retain two items, pre-adolescents three to seven, older is five to nine words in that stage. Um, and uh, it takes a lot of active attention in the frontal lobe to use the working memory processes. Um, and um, we, we need to keep that in mind as we're exposing uh, people to language. Many people say small kids learn, learn another language just automatically. They don't have any problem with that. Um, that's actually not true because they process uh, memory differently. And we all know this expression when little kids sit there and they look totally blank because they turn off, they shut their own and, and they have this blank expression in their face because it's too much for them. They cannot process it anymore. Whereas older adults, the older you get, the more you can process which is an advantage. Also, the older you get, the more you can build on your already existing um, linguistic system in your brain. So what is the impact of teaching on all this brain stuff? Teachers must provide experiences that reorganize visual recognition and broaden cerebral networks. That's a lot of big words, but um, like we talked about, you know, giving pictures to a word. Um, you know, recycling, um, scaffolding, presenting the words in different contexts and giving students assistance and um, letting them first fill in the blank and then giving them sentences, sentence frames and so forth, all builds those networks. And I think most of you already do that, even though you may not know why in the brain you did this, but you already do this. Um, the key is repetition and practice. The more practice, the more consolidated the new processes become and they become transfer from fire and wire to neural pathways where the student doesn't need to think about it anymore and doesn't need to make a decision. Um, the more reading practice they have, um, the more they are able to decode and comprehend. comprehend. And this is a really interesting thing. A lot of kids are afraid to read or read aloud. And there's been some really cool research done lately that um, had kids read to animals and uh, particularly in that study, they took kids to an animal shelter 
and the kids were allowed to the animals and they didn't have the inhibitions and fear of mis making mistakes that they had in class or with adults and they became much more fluent readers in a very short time. So just FYI. Um, so when we do literacy instruction, we need to be very, very intentional on how we present reading and writing and speaking to our students. We need to think about the brain and what it needs to master huge tasks um, in, in how to help the students to, to build those pathways. Be, we need to be very mindful of the time that it takes to process language. And with that, I'm particularly concerned with our ESL students that are in content gen ed classrooms where teachers are not aware of these processes and um, they don't appreciate how difficult it is for the student to create that new knowledge of the new discipline that they're learning. And it's not just the academic language and background, but also the language of math is very different from the language of language arts. So the, the way of using language. They need to have a lot of exposure, lots of exposure, scaffolding, recycling, lots of practice lots of images, lots of support materials, and even acting out things or role playing or, you know, um, any way that they get tactilely involved or, you know, touch things and involve a um, lot of different parts of the brain at the same time. And we also, and this is also important, many of us forget that it's so important to provide opportunities to develop L1. Just because a kid speaks Spanish with the parents at home, most of them cannot academically use it to read and write, you know. Um, and um, the more exposure and, um, and mastery we can help the students to acquire in L1, the more it pays in L2 because um, we already can uh, fall back on those linguistic systems. But if they don't have them, if they cannot read and write in their home language, we cannot do that. Um, so I'm always a big proponent for pushing L1 and actually I give a session at 10 o'clock about this topic, um, very topic. Um, you know, for um, excellent instruction, we need to have appropriate materials with a lot of pictures. We need to have a lot of read alouds. Um, we need to rewrite materials so they are able to digest them. And I don't know if you guys use the WIDA app assessment system, but WIDA provides excellent uh, can-do descriptors on how to do all these things. And it's also important to provide supplemental materials, um, pictures, sounds, um, mimicking experiences that students can have to build background knowledge um, and um, for their brain to build those semantic lexicons. Paraphrasing is also very important. Use mental imagery, use audiovisual aids, cooperative learning groups, pre-teach and reteach vocabulary, the new meaning for a no, new, known word, meaning for a new word and a known concept, meaning of a new word for an unknown concept, and clarifying and enriching meaning of a known word which can be used in different contexts. An example for that is the preposition by. Um, the teacher may say, come sit by me um, or come by my house. And then all of a sudden in math, the teacher says, divide eight by two. And the students go like, um, why is the preposition used here? And they don't know the purpose of the word by in the math language. And so they are confused in this moment because they have never heard by used that way. So we need to pay attention to those kind of things. And I hope you can share with your gen ed teachers um, to pay attention to, to academic language and particularly the, the language for their discipline and um, context codes. Um, I'm looking at time here, we're already over. Um, I'm not going to show you the video um, because we're over time, but here's a good reference. Here's my email. And I go back to that a second. And these are pictures of my home here um, where I cooked some German stuff and how I look with my German dress. <laughs> All right, here we are. Thank you very much.
very much, Dr. Brody. That was wonderful. Um, I wish we could clap for you. I suppose we can in Zoom. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Joining us. We don't have enough questions for now. Dr. Brody is doing a breakout session a little later. Um, additionally, we have some um, we have some wonderful uh, exhibitors for you to visit now. Um, but be sure to come check out her her breakout talk and get a little bit more into detail with things. Um, and for those of you who are asking about the PowerPoint, I will ask Dr. Brody and get back to you. Thank you very yeah, much, I Dr. Brody. It, I sent it to you already last night. They're asking for permission for me to give it to, the, to them. Oh yeah, please, please do share it with them, of course. And thank you so much for, um, for coming today. I'm downloading the chat here um, to my computer. And if there's any questions, uh, I will send the answer to Molly. Very good. Thank you very much. Bye.